Hi everyone, welcome to Collection Spotlight with the Coast Center for the Arts and First American Art Magazine. We're so pleased to have you with us today for our wonderful conversation. I'm Bess Murphy. I'm the curator at the Coast Center here in Santa Fe. And I'm the one who's here on site at the Co. Um, working with the pieces hands-on um, from our collection that all of our artists select to speak about. So I'm gonna pass it over. We'll, we'll introduce the artist and everyone else as we go along, but I'll pass it over to Rachel Wixom, um, the president uh, and the director of the Co. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We have an exciting program with Evelyn today. I'm really thrilled to be part of this and uh, thank her very much as well as America for the partnership that we, this wonderful partnership that's developed. Um, the Co Center, probably many of you know, it's connection and learning through indigenous arts. We have a collection of around 2,300 pieces from all over the world. We're an immersive hands-on experience. So during COVID, unfortunately, we're uh, closed to the public but we're trying to reach out through virtual hands-on experiences such as this one. So I'm gonna pass this on to America to introduce Evelyn and take it from here. Hi, and I'm America Meredith and um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, so I publish a uh, First American Art Magazine. So we're a quarterly print and digital magazine and we cover Native American art, um, indigenous art of the Americas, North and South America. So I am really happy with this partnership between our magazine and the Co in Santa Fe. So that's one good thing about this time period is we can melt um, geographic barriers. And it's my profound honor to welcome Evelyn Vanderhoop who greets us today from uh, Baja, California. So she maybe she can talk a little bit about where she's at. But she's a renowned Haida textile artist. She comes from a very well-respected um, weaving family. And she she weaves nash, nahin, I'm sorry, chokout weaving, and then also raven's tail. And she can describe that more in detail. But these are some of the most complex tech um, weaving techniques in the entire world. Um, the chokout, they've mastered um, many different media and are able to do curvilinear weaving. So she makes it sound easy, but it's not. I had a roommate that did it. And, it takes almost a year to do a single robe. They're some of the greatest art forms on our planet. So I'm so grateful that um, we get to welcome Evelyn right now. So Evelyn, I'll get rid of me. Well, thank you very much for that uh, great introduction. I'm really happy to be uh, here to speak on that beautiful robe that the uh, Ralph T. Co. Uh, Center has there. and. Um, I've also uh, looked into some of uh, his collection and uh, found out that he's collected much uh, from my family. And uh, so it, it's fun to look at his collection now and, and hear about his adventures collecting. So um, I'm really honored that you've asked me to be part of this conversation as far as uh, discussing the textiles of the Northwest Coast. So I, I have a few, um, uh, slides uh, and before we start examining that beautiful robe just to get some history and uh, a, a little bit more about those textiles both Raven's Tail and the Nahin. So do you want to go to those now? Sure. Okay, and I do want to point out that um, anyone who has any questions, Evelyn actually um, says that it's okay to ask the questions during the conversation. But um, you can put them and enter them in the chat, type them in the chat and I'll be able to read them. And we'll flip over to screen sharing very quickly. Sorry, I do this once a month and that's just, just enough time to forget how to do everything. I apologize. <laughs> and Evelyn, you are normally based in, um, you're normally based in British Columbia, right? Right. I live in um, Masset up in uh, Haida Gwaii. And, um, but my husband is a retired uh, fisherman. So I uh, have been coming down to the Baja where he loves the sun. I take my weaving. He's retired. I'm not. So um, I get to weave. Uh, down here in the sun. And that's what your homeland looks more like, huh? Yeah, yeah. 
Well, this is a painting actually that I painted. And uh, oh, wow. yeah, because I wanted to uh, point out that the Haidas have a saying called, we, we say, the world is as sharp as a knife. And um, the, the meaning is that, um, of course, you know, you can, the world changes on a dime and that is one of the meanings, but we actually lived on the um, thin zone, the beach uh, between the forest and the ocean. And so um, that when you're dealing with two uh, very different ecosystems, and you place yourself between those, you have to come up with solutions to uh, how to thrive in your environment. And because you've got those two ecosystems, usually you come up with some pretty complex solutions. And that really relates to our art. Um, in all the world, if you look at our art, it's, it's very sophisticated. And um, so um, the next slide. Okay. I just want to point out, I love how you put the canoe very subtly in the background and then the man wearing the woven cedar hat. Yeah. It's really extreme right. sub subtlety. But anyway. That's actually a, um, a copy of the um, Bill Reed uh, canoe that was on the Canadian $20 for a spell. So uh, I put him right there in the clouds, the canoe, mm -hmm. full of all the supernatural beings. Yeah, very subtle. So, so the next. And one. when you say northern Northwest Coast, what area are you talking about? What communities? Well, um, the northern Northwest Coast is up in um, Alaska and British Columbia, uh, as opposed to the southern down near the uh, Vancouver area. So. Um, <clears throat> where uh, the major cultures are the Tlingit, Haidas, and Simsians. And um, so we really depended on um, the cedar in our area. So um, the first, and we lived in a rainforest. So the first um, substance and fiber that we used for our clothing was the cedar. So we, um, we of course, uh, made our huge longhouses and our huge canoes and our totem poles out of that cedar. But in addition to that, that was our first uh, uh, garments. We made them out of the cedar. Uh, next slide. And there's a, a contemporary canoe. So we've continued to make canoes uh, out of our cedar. And um, this must be a very warm day. We've got the men all uh, shirtless, but in um, if it was raining or it was cold, we'd be wearing uh, cedar bark. In the old days, we would have been wearing cedar bark garments, cedar bark canoe capes. Next slide. So here is a, uh, a couple of uh, images from New York at the Museum of Natural History there in New York. and. Uh, it's all going to change, of course. Uh, they're, they're really changing up that great hall. But these are images that I took years ago and I was studying the cedar in the garments and, um, and they had the mannequins set, set up and uh, showing them filleting fish. This particular person, although you can't really see it, he has a, um, a pounder. So uh, the person is sitting there pounding cedar and that is what the garments were made from. They were made from pounded red cedar. And, the, and, um, and then the wefts were made from yellow cedar because the yellow cedar is more pliable. So um, the warps were red cedar and the more pliable inner bark of the yellow cedar was used for the wefts. Next slide. So, um, I was able to go and study at the British Museum. My sister and I were invited there. I was to study the textiles and she uh, looked over the basketry. But um, my mother uh, got this commission to replicate a Captain Cook um, robe that had been collected in 1778 when Cook came to the Nootka, what he called the Nootka area. 
And um, a lot of these cedar robes and uh, skirts were topped and uh, with a, a geometric patterning and also along the bottom was geometric patterning. And I was really excited about um, about when I went to Britain and saw some of uh, the early uh, garments, because if you look really close, you'll see uh, bits of the mountain goat uh, wool. Of course, the mountain goat wool made the designs um, in, in that uh, swirling, swirling uh, lightning design there, but also the wefts had uh, mountain goat. And after I had the experience of helping my mother and being a helper with her on the uh, robe she replicated of Captain Cook's, then I go and study and I see that the wefts uh, got the wool included. It was, it was really like, it's so logical because it, it would be so much nicer on your hands to have the nice soft uh, mountain goat wool. So early on, those uh, cedar capes had some wool in them, not only in the geometric top and bottom borders, but also in the wefts. And that was a really interesting discovery. Next slide. Okay. So I also was able to um, uh, become a Yale fellow, actually. I, I wrote an application to study at the Beinecke Library, and he, they, the Beinecke has original watercolors painted in 1793 by Sigamus Backstrom. And you were, we were in looking and studying at those paintings. I was curious uh, about some of the robes that were um, painted by him. Now these two, um, left one, the, the left one is a fur robe and you can tell by the, by the textures Sorry, that he's about. using. And then, and then the right side is a leather one. And um, with a, mic, with a um, magnifying glass, I really looked at the original um, uh, paintings to see um, what was woven because I, I really um, want to study the first two decades of the contact. So I've been doing that for the last 20 years. And so it was a real thrill to see these watercolor paintings, original watercolor paintings that were done in 1793. And a part of Sigmund Backstrom's uh, collection of work, he had eight portraits of Haida and in the various uh, garments that they wore back then. Can you go back, America, one more slide? Because um, there's a slide of the lady with the blue cake, the blue robe. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, back one, I believe. Or okay. yes, right there. Now, this particular um, painting is of a chief's daughter, and she has a blue robe. And so I really look close at that original painting to see if the rows of weavings um, and, and what she was wearing, was it a trade cloth made out of a trade cloth or was it a, a woven robe that she was wearing? So I was able to look through uh, and, and see the techniques of his painting. And I determined that those blue robes that he painted on these people were robes that were woven by the Haidas and that were colored uh, and most likely dyed uh, that blue color. Another thing is that um, that dress, that dress has sleeves and, so, and, and it's cinched in and quite tailored. So a lot of people who have looked at these paintings, they say to the, this particular one, they say, oh, that dress is a trade dress. Well, I went and uh, with my magnifying glass, I went and I looked at that dress very, very closely. And um, you can see that the deck neckline has an uneven um, edge to it, as well as those uh, wrists on the sleeves. So I believe that that is a tanned leather dress that, um, and that, um, <clears throat> that has the sleeves. And in 1774, when Juan Perez, he was the first one to come to our coast, the Northwest coast, uh, and uh, to the Haidas. Um, the, he landed up there in Langara Island, um, North Island. And he um, said that he's, they, the people, the witnesses on that boat, the Santiago, they witnessed that our 
our garments were very tailored and that we did have sleeves. So the, the bottom of this dress, if you see the diagonal patterning, that is so similar to the fact that with garments, we put designs on our garments and they meant, meant things. So um, if you look really close to this painting, it's a row of buttons. So very early on, we took those, rate, uh, those trade buttons and we aligned them into designs that were, um, were after those woven designs that were, wo uh, were woven on our cedar robes. So um, it's a, I love this painting of this chief's uh, daughter. And you could see that um, she's got the fork and she's hanging it on as a necklace. So it's a valuable thing. And so she made it a jewelry. Um, I, I don't know, maybe she even used it as a tool, but it, I, I just love how she's hung it as a jewelry. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay. Do you wanna look at this again? Um, maybe down the way. Did you want to, or should I move forward? Here's the next one. Oh, oh, move. Yeah, move to the next one. Okay, so stay here. Well, with this one, um, I did talk about the different um, overcoats, but the on the um, left hand side there was um, the trousers, and we didn't use trousers, nor did we use foot. No, no. Um, moccasins or footgear. So um, all of these were, um, Sigmund Backstrom, Backstrom, he wasn't the artist. He was, he was the uh, physician, he was the surgeon. So when I look at these paintings, I think that they were probably very ethnologically uh, true. Um, so here is another, here, here's another painting of a Haida chief. And he is wearing what looks to be a, a pounded cedar uh, robe, but then you see those two borders down on the lower, bo his lower border. And then they are again uh, woven um, with the diagonal uh, design. And then also there's the um, motifs of the um, square motifs. And, um, I paired it with an image of a very early um, Nahin robe that um, it talks about transitioning from the pounded cedar capes to the full mountain uh, mountain um, mountain goat uh, fiber capes and and robes. Next slide. Oh. Is that the one you want? Yeah, this is a good one because you can, if you look real close, you can see flecks of the uh, mountain goat fiber on the, in those webs. And also you see that um, very early on, we were geometric weavers and we evolved to be, have the ability to do the curves and, and the circles. And you can see right here, this is very, very early on. And, uh, and they wanted to have uh, irises on those eyes, but the eyes turned out to be square because weavers were um, restricted with the warp of uh, uh, the vertical hanging warp and the, and the um, uh, horizontal wefts. And so um, getting those circles and curves was a real technical challenge. And uh, it was some, somebody in the past uh, had this aha moment where um, instead of weaving all in one direction, um, like the early uh, geometric robes were woven uh, with all the rows separate to itself and all um, starting on the left and tying off on the right. And so when we uh, needed to develop uh, the ovoids in the form line, there was the technical problem. So we um, uh, figured out a way where we could weave instead of, uh, instead of all in one direction that we wove back and forth and that we had interlocked joins. So this is a real interesting little face that uh, I love to look at and examine when I want to uh, be reminded how things uh, progressed in, in a continuum of um, style and technical uh, 
abilities. Next slide. I love it. So what's unique about the Haida weavers are that they weave down. So if uh, their neighbors, the Clinkets and the Simpsians, and even the Salish people, when they weave a basket, they hold that basket in their lap and they weave up from the bottom up to up the sides. Where in this, these two pictures of the early weavers, um, they're both Haida's and they're weaving down. Um, so all our neighbors around us would wove up and we wove down. The only other group close to us that weave down in Alaska is the Aleut people. They, they weave down also. Um, but um, the chief's robes, the raven's tail and the naheen, they were all constructed on a very simple loom and we wove down. And the, uh, all of the people, the Clinkets and the Simpsons, when they weave the chief's robes, they weave down. But I think that it's logical that the Haidas were very early weavers of this robe uh, tradition. Uh, and it would have been a simple, uh, uh, simple for us because we already were weaving and used to weaving down with our baskets. Next row, next slide. So another group of people that weave down are the um, Maori people. My sister Holly Churchill and I, we were honored to be invited to be part of a weaving symposium down in New Zealand. And my sister, she's so generous. She brought lots of gifts and so the Maori people, of course, their, their tradition is very generous in, in that gifting way. And so they gifted back. And I was able to weave on a um, Maori um, feather cape um, oh. while I was down there. And so um, we really enjoyed ourselves, um, my sister and I. Next slide. So um, many cultures wove down. Uh, on the upper left is a um, painting from a vase, uh, a, a Greek vase. And um, you can see that the early Greek had a loom very similar to ours. Although um, they did weigh their warps with um, a, a, a clay weights. Um, then the lower uh, painting is done with uh, a Celtic, the Celtic. Celtics would, um, would uh, we they think they've dug up enough archeological things to, um, uh, to determine that they did have looms that were uh, gravity weighted and that they did weave down. Um, the main black and white larger uh, painting or uh, photograph is of a um, weaver in the Southwest and, um, sh and she is weaving up. And even the very simple um, backstrap looms uh, of the Southwest and the South American people, they, um, they weave up. And those uh, very complicated uh, floor looms of the classic um, weavers, uh, they weave up. Uh, so, so it's very rare that uh, there's cultures that have continued uh, with the twine, te uh, twine techniques and that, we, that weave down. Next slide. So um, we have found archaeological evidence of the early geometric weaving of the Northwest Coast, the earliest uh, mountain goat chief's robes. And um, here is one that was, um, was uh, dug from a, a Sitka archaeological dig. So um, they call this the Castle Hill fragment, and I think that um, they, um, it, it is housed at the, uh, in Juneau at the Alaska State Museum. But it's really interesting to um, see um, these early remnants. And, I, and this is how Cheryl Samuel did uh, reconstructed this ancient technique that had been more or less forgotten for many, many years. And she went along the world and researched in different museums and she found 11, um, 11 ro uh, robes or parts of robes of this early style. And uh, just uh, looking at these remnants, these uh, ragged remnants, she was able to analyze 
and, um, and weave uh, the robes. Next slide. Mm. So here is my mother in all her glory. She's, I, my mother is very modern. She's our modern Millie in our traditional Haida uh, weaving family. She really pushes uh, beyond the boundaries of tradition. She um, created the uh, first uh, Raven's Tail tunic and she was thrilled with this new, new form of uh, Raven's Tail until she found the, uh, that uh, Sigmund Backstrom painting that had the tunic with the different uh, checkerboard uh, patterns. And then she was like, oh, my ancestors, the ancestors always, uh, it seems like you could never uh, uh, do something new that they, they had done it before. And she, so, um, but she's always uh, forward thinking, always wanting to, uh, push boundaries and go into the contemporary. Next slide. So the Nahin uh, robes were often, they were owned by clans, but they could also be owned by uh, chiefs individually. And this is an example of a chief of Skidigit whose um, totem pole um, held his remains. And you can see the remnants of his um, Nahin chief's robe. I'm, talk I'm saying Nahin, and that is the word for the, um, the uh, form line chief's robe, uh, which now we often commonly call Chilkat. Um, but it, the Clinkets and the Haidas both shared the word Nahin for the form line chief's robe. Next slide. So um, I always like to show this um, lady who is there weaving uh, in progress a uh, Nahin robe because um, the, I, when she first started, uh, there's a photograph of her first starting and my two teachers were Dolores Churchill and Cheryl Samuel and they uh, were teachers them, themselves, you know, they, they went around teaching so sometimes it was hard to uh, find them or even by telephone calling them up and so when I first hung my very first robe and everything was done, the black, big black borders and the yellow borders. And I was like, okay, now I'm ready to start the center. And where should I start? And then I saw the photograph of this young Clinket uh, lady and, uh, and she was starting right in the center. And so I always consider her one of my teachers. But um, the, the diving whale is a very prominent um, pattern for the, um, when I go and study in museums, the diving whale is the prevalent pattern that we I see in the drawers of the in the museums, and um, and that's what's so exciting about um, uh, seeing and talking about um, the robe that the um, Ralph T. Co. Center has because it is another um, uh, entity of the sea. Even though this one, the diving whale, is more prevalent, um, the sea bear is. Um, is less prevalent, but it does still represent the power of the sea. Next slide. Well, uh, okay, so here's a tunic and um, I always love to see, um, see things uh, in museums that I know where they come from. Now this tunic uh, was, uh, part of um, an ensemble of uh, uh, that uh, the in the photograph on the left is a group of people in the Prince, Prince of Wales area, um, I believe in Hal Can and um, maybe Click Kwan. One, one of those two villages is where this photograph was taken. So here is a group of Haida people. And then uh, this tunic ended up in uh, New York. When I first looked at it and examined it, it was at the Hay Center in New York. And then it moved uh, then out of Washington, D.C. to the uh, um, Museum of the American Indian. But um, to um, know that this was a tunic that a Haida wore um, really uh, 
uh, it, I love those discoveries where um, you not only see um, the object, but you see the the people who who had the object, and then and then you read the stories, and then maybe even more you can understand the patterns. But um, I, when we were practicing for this session, um, one of the questions was. Uh, could I mention and talk something about the form line of Northwest Coast? And I just want to point out that um, in uh, the Nahin uh, designing, there more uh, there's of course the circles and the U forms and the ovoids, but we um, the designing is a little bit more angular than the regular uh, form line of of the Northwest Coast. So you'll see more angles too. Um, the Nahin designing. But that's one of our weakest parts of our Northwest Coast art today is that um, because um, so uh, so few pe pe people weave nowadays, it's um, or, or weave this particular style nowadays that uh, even less um, uh, do we have of men who design our pattern boards. So um, pattern boards and designers are real rare. Next slide. So here are my major mentors in my life uh, in, and in my weaving. My mother, uh, Dolores Churchill on the right and my Nani Selena uh, Paradovich on the left. And they, my three sisters and I were taken to the woods and to the beach to gather materials uh, when we were uh, old enough to walk. And um, so we were taught how to, um, how to thank the material, how to treat it properly, uh, how to um, store it, how to, um, to uh, prepare it. And um, so I, I, along with my sisters learned all that, but um, my sisters are the ones that went on and became basket weavers. And I followed in my mother's uh, footsteps with her love of the textiles. She discovered that early on and I watched her and uh, caught, caught the love of uh, weaving the textiles from my mother. Next slide. Mm. So here's my mother with my, uh, me and my two sisters and my nephew, um, Aaron. Um, I always like to say we need the men. We take them into the woods too and they get to uh, use their muscles helping their nannies and their aunties and their mothers. Um, Justin, his, his brother uh, really helps out a lot every spring. Uh, so we gather our material as a family. Uh, it's a family event and um, we bring our children there and uh, continue to bring our children in, into into the world and show them where where the things are that our ancestors uh, found them and used them. Next slide. So oh. I'm very proud of passing on um, the weaving techniques to my daughters. I have my two daughters, Carrie Ann Vanderhoop and Tiffany Amber Vanderhoop. And Carrie Ann actually um, had a commission to do a chief's robe um, at the start of her Harvard University year, she went to Harvard for a master's of education. And when a week before she was to graduate, she finished that robe. So the whole year of her studying her master's. And uh, I, so I flew out there, of course, and I was very proud to stand up and say that I was proud of her to get a master's of education, but I was as equally proud that she uh, finished that chief's robe and that that uh, gave her a master's of the textiles. So I was very happy that, that uh, for that. Next slide. So here is a photo of my mother in, um, it isn't Washington DC, it's across the Pontiac and uh, in uh, Maryland, I think is where they do the, uh, all of the uh, ceremonies for um, when the people get their masters of uh, artist master for the um, National Heritage um, uh, Award. And so these are uh, all five of her granddaughters that came out to the stage to sing and to dance her onto the stage as she received that award. Next slide. 
So it's really exciting, I feel, to, to go into museums that hold uh, and, and um, conserve our, our art. And so um, I was lucky enough to be, receive a, an um, artist, um, um, artist in residence um, for, with the Smithsonian in both the year 2000 and in the year 2005, I was invited back. Um, and so I was in Washington DC out at Suitland and um, I was walking, I was studying the textiles and um, sometimes those textiles have uh, arsenic and, uh, and uh, anyway, I, I think I was getting a little dizzy. So I thought I better get my nose out of the textiles and just take a break. So I was walking along the shelves and I saw this uh, plank. Uh, and here the painting was on the plank. And I, I looked closer and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a pattern board for the tunic that I just was looking at. And so I, I uh, ran over and told a uh, conservator, uh, that, uh, hey, you have the pattern board for the tunic. And uh, so it was a quite an exciting ex uh, discovery for me as well as for uh, the people there. And so they put the two together and uh, took, took a photo, but that, that's really an exciting uh, uh, discovery. And that pattern board uh, helped me understand a few other, uh, uh, other tunics. Next slide. So here is uh, a couple more tunics. Uh, in addition to the one that we just saw there, the, um, the one that is, has the more colder blue, the more ultramarine blue, that's at the Seattle Art Museum. And the one that has the softer blue, that's now at the Autry. And um, I've, I've also included a, a photo of that plank that's in um, the National Museum, or well, the Museum of the Natural uh, the Museum of the American Indian. But um, so uh, it, this was really exciting because that pattern board gave the weaver a choice. And usually we were dictated by our pattern boards and we very rarely as a weavers got choices. But if you uh, were to look uh, down at the lower, um, just above the, the feet of the lower um, uh, part of that pattern board, you'll see that those two major eyes, they're kind of upside down. One has one style and the other has another style of, of eye. And so um, if you look close at both these actual weavings, um, one has, the, has chosen, one weaver has chosen to do the eye style of the left and the other weaver chose to do the eye style of the right. So, um, those were exciting uh, discoveries too, but uh, this is a lovely uh, tunic. Next slide, please. Sure. So I've done a tunic. This, uh, the one that I'm wearing there is one of, uh, it, I wove. It was a replication of um, a tunic that's at the um, Glenbow in uh, Calgary, Alberta. And um, I believe it is of, of the uh, bear mother story tunic. And um, so um, once uh, every two years uh, in Juneau, the people of Alaska come together to celebrate and uh, to bring out their regalia, to bring out their songs and their dance and their stories. And so one, one year, I believe it was 2012, I was up there and this lady was dancing this tunic. And I had heard that, um, uh, women aren't, aren't necessarily the ones who wear the tunics. Um, it, it's mostly uh, the prerogative of men. So I went up to her and, and, and asked her about this tunic and, I, and, um, and, and told her what I had heard. And she said that she was actually the treasure holder for her clan and that she went to her clan to ask permission to use the tunic at, at the celebration. So I, I, I really enjoyed watching the tunic dance with her. Um, and it was, um, uh, this bear mother pattern, um, is, is very similar to, um, what, uh, she is wearing, but the color choice, um, it, it just a little bit of difference in the color choices. Um, next slide, please. So this is me in my first, my first robe. Um, I was kind of naive when I accepted this commission. 
it came through my mother and also Cheryl Samuel. They both had um, actually turned down the commission and, they, and my mother and both of them uh, recommended that I weave um, the commission. And so that was my start. That was my first rope that I did. But I had no, no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea that it was going to take me almost three years to weave. Um, and uh, it was, it was quite, a, quite an experience. But uh, Bill Holm actually helped me because um, I didn't have a pattern board for this particular um, uh, robe and um but it is a replication of a robe that's in uh, new york at the museum of natural history and uh there was a, a very nice photo of it and bill holm scanned the photo and then he mathematically uh figured it out and taped uh, a, a bunch of eight by eleven uh printing paper out and uh he he provided me with my pattern board so bill holm was uh very instrumental in my first uh, project next slide so um, I, I love, you know, I, my mother really is, like I say, the, our, the modern Millie in our family, but um, she also mentors me to push my boundaries. So um, I wanted to, um, the um, Bill Reed uh, Gallery uh, asked me to co-curate with Martine Reed uh, a textile exhibit in 2010. And so, um, so I did, and I tried to uh, put all people together that have helped with the revival of not, of not only the um, Nahin, but also the, of course, the uh, Raven's Tale, bringing back the old techniques. And so um, it was the first textile exhibit of the Northwest Coast I I ever, really. And, um, and I was honored to be co-curator of that. And this was uh, the canoe cape that is on the right was what I came up with. I needed to push my boundaries. Um, and, uh, and so um, I, I gave myself a lot of problems when it came to this uh, weaving. But um, my mother and my sisters, they uh, mentor me to uh, never go easy, always, always, uh, always try something new and, um, and once you start it, finish it. So my daughter here is uh, Carrie Ann. She, like I say, both my daughters have gone into uh, the weaving and she, Carrie Ann is a real big uh, help to me. She's always, um, always uh, assisting me. Um, and uh, so here is a, she's uh, modeling a um, a dance bib that I brought to Santa Fe. We were um, invited to be part of the Jane Sauer uh, uh, exhibit um, uh, in her ex in her gallery there in Santa Fe a few years back, and um, uh, and that dance um, bib uh, went to a collector at that at that show. Um, I think that it was my daughter singing. She wore it and she had a drum and she was singing and so. Uh, the collector just, uh, it all came together and he, he, his wife couldn't leave without it. Next, next slide. So here is a robe that is still on the, the uh, loom and you can see it's uh, gravity weighted. It's uh, slightly curved at the bottom and it now is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Canadian History in uh, in um, what used to be Hull, but I think now is Gatineau. Next slide, please. And here she, uh, my daughter Tiffany is dancing it. Um, I always, even if a museum collects my work, I always uh, make sure that there's a stipulation that uh, it is brought out in its own, its own feast and um, and that it has its first dance. And so Tiffany is dancing that, uh, that robe that will eventually uh, uh, go to the museum. And, um, and the museum actually came to Masset and hosted this, uh, this dinner and, um, and, and gave gifts out. So it was quite, quite a nice gathering. Uh, next slide.
Okay, I, I'm taking longer than I'd like, and I really want to get to um, the um, robe that is um, in the collection of the Ralph T. Coe Center. So I'm going to move ahead. Here is um, uh, on the lower part is a robe uh, that is that I wove um, that I wanted to bring the um, the ruler of the sea and the ruler of the weather. I wanted it bring to bring it out of the drawer. All uh, it it was a tattered and um, I was able to uh, weave it in replication and uh, I really um, and now it's traveling the world with the uh, hearts of our peoples um, uh, exhibit. Uh, next slide. This robe was recently collected by the um, Museum of um, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts it, and they re just recently hung it uh, two weeks ago, I think, or uh, it was uh, finally hung and it is hung with my mother's tunic there in the um, in Boston there at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts. And, um, and this is an example of a raven's tail robe. Next slide. I think this is the end, right? Yeah, so we, my family, I like we started. I do come from a a, a family, um, um, and I and I hope I do my part in teaching my children as well as other students to keep this art alive and to keep having it dance into the future. So I'd like to. Um, talk now about the um, lovely uh, standing bear robe that is in the collection of uh, Ted Coe's collection. I really, it, I really um, enjoyed uh, seeing it yesterday during our practice session and, uh, and um, uh, Bess was able to uh, actually turn it, uh, flip it over and I was able to see how uh, the big bands were put together. And uh, so hopefully we can look closer at it now. One thing I did notice was that it's missing its side braids. So um, uh, oftentimes these robes were um, displayed and danced. And when somebody passed away, they often would even put it on totem poles. So um, with this robe, it's a very, very early robe. And um, I think because it's missing its side braids that it really had a, a, a very active life in dancing because oftentimes those side braids are the first to start unraveling. And I could see a collector seeing some unraveling uh, and then want to just uh, take it take it off so that there wouldn't be the unraveling look to it. So I, I, that's my theory that that is why this particular robe is is missing its side braids. But uh, out of the side braids, there was fringe. And um, so there, uh, so this, Naheen robes are surrounded by fringe. And, um, and there's even an overlay on the fringe of these Naheen robes. And um, so, so there's cedar in the warps of the Naheen Chilkat robes. And then there's an overlay of warps that have no cedar in it. So uh, it lightens up the look of the fringe and it also fills, makes, makes the fringe quite full. So, um, so uh, that was, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, thing that, uh, that the uh, overlay is, is there, but the side fringes are not there. So, um, uh, the fringe is a very important uh, part of the mountain goat uh, weaving. The um, Salish people, there's a story about a young boy who was sitting by a river and here came the sun deity. He came down and he, he asked if he could switch garments. And so they switched garments. And then the, the sun deity showed the young man how the out of the fringe came the five uh, kinds of salmon. So, uh, and then there's uh, the Simsian chief had two roles. He was uh, the clan chief, but he was also uh, a great dancer. 
he, a, 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 a wee halite. So he had two functions and he, in the super uh, or secret societies, that uh, second function, the spiritual um, function, he would uh, often take initiates of, of secret societies and that uh, the fringe as he danced was thought to throw power to the initiates. So fringe was very important. So um, I was hoping um, that maybe there were questions that um, I could answer. I didn't hear any uh, through my uh, talk, but uh, was there questions? Also, Bess, could you give a little bit of background to this rope? Because it's incredibly old. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like in the midst of all of these uh, different cameras. So <laughs> um, no worries. Yeah, so this is, we don't really have a whole lot on the provenance on this piece in terms of where, um, how it wound up fully coming through the lines of collectors. But we do know that it's probably um, mid to late 19th century. So it's really an early piece. Uh, Evelyn and I were talking a little bit about how there's some commercial, um, and I don't know if you can see this, I'm picking up our iPad here so that maybe you can get a different view, but that there is commercial yarn and then there's also um, hand spun yarn that has, that's the mountain goat. She was talking about the different textures of that. And so it sort of, I think could be seen as a, a bit of a transitional piece perhaps. Um, so that's a little bit more on that. And we have it as either Haida or Klingit. And so, um, I think Evelyn could speak a little bit more to that in terms of not specifying um, between those two for this piece. And Evelyn, you also said that Shimshim people also made very similar robes and these designs were all exchanged? Yes, yes. Um, it, the the Haidas, the Clinkets, and the Simpsons were responsible for, the, we, we were the ones, <laughs> weavers of these robes. And, um, Oftentimes you can see the early Simpsian robes uh, identified because they were, they had more of a forest green where the, what, what they used to dye the blue would oxidize further into being green. So this particular robe is a very lovely uh, light blue, which probably was more of a blue green uh, when it started out. Um, uh, Bess, could you flip it over to see if the, uh, the blue is even brighter in the back. Oh, wow. So yeah. I don't know if you all can see that, but it's, it's definitely, yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely a little bit bluer in the black like, that back. That was fantastic. Yes, th that blue is a lovely color. And like I say, the Simpsons, they used, um, they used a copper oxide, I think, and, and, and their dye bath was a beautiful blue green. And then they would take it out and then it would darken up uh, because of the oxidation. But um, mm -hmm. this blue green, um, you know, every group along our coast had different sources for the blue. So um, it, it's uh, always a mystery when you see the different colors of the blue. But with the yellow, the yellow was always a consistent color because it was a trade item. We used um, an intern, a, a, we used a, what they call a wolf moss that was um, gained in trade with the people who lived on the mainland. So, um, so the yellow is usually a very consistent throughout all of my researching, the yellow is the most consistent hue where the blue is the more variable. This is a lovely blue. Mm. And then there was a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Evelyn. You're fine. Um, well, uh, I was just going to say, because these designs were so compact and so conventionalized, um, and they splayed uh, the uh, bilateral designing of the, uh, the being, oftentimes it's really hard to figure out what, what it is, right? So you have to you have to go along and read, go and, and move your eye around the form line. And those form lines, the major form lines are identified because they're thicker 
And then they are the ones that cause the border to the main being. So you kind of follow along the form line to figure things out. But one of the things that makes me say that this is a standing um, bear and possibly a supernatural sea bear, it, well, definitely a bear, is because it has these soft uh, rounded ears. And that is one of the uh, distinguishing things of a bear in our in uh, form line art is that they have this uh, rounded um, uh, ear form uh, motifs. Right, and this one, right, and this one has this lovely um, rounded uh, ear motifs. I, I saw that Steve Brown actually thought it was a, a, also a sea bean, uh, a, a, a possibly another form of the guna kode. Um, he called it a sea monster, but really, I think it's a, it's a powerful sea being um, that has several names. But um, the diving whale uh, can can pass between different uh, nations, and um, I think it's because we all uh, have a we were canoe people, so we always wanted to appease and have good sailing, and good weather, good. Uh, uh, a good way to go to uh, trade or or um, gather uh, our resources, and so it was important that the weather was uh, was uh, good weather for uh, canoe travel. So um, these uh, robes, like this um, supernatural sea being that you have, um, I believe they were um, they were used for supernatural helping for the chief to be get help from the supernatural. And they would wear these robes um, going out into the water. Um, but they didn't wear them as they traveled. They would keep them in their box. They had a big box that they would, um, it, it, they would keep their special things in. So these robes were always um, honored and protected. So there's a couple of questions, and one of them is um, in the slideshow in your PowerPoint. When you were showing the Nahin, the formal and chief's robe, uh, there was a large wooden structure in the photo. Do you recall what that large wooden structure might have been? That was a box. And that was uh, the reason why I had it in there was that um, I think I'm thinking of the right slide. That, that, that there are th the boxes held the treasures. And so um, I felt like it was important. And those boxes have the same the same major um, being, the ruler of the ocean and the weather. Uh, and the majority of those patterns on, on um, traveling boxes, especially, or boxes that held uh, the treasures, they had the guna date in that in their pattern too. And I think that it was because they were uh, they were sentinels. They protected the treasures and they protected um, uh, the chief. And then uh, another question that's kind of complex: What do Haida and Clinket and Shimshin communities think about non-tribal uh, members learning to do this kind of weaving? I think that um, we are we are. Um, getting more and more, uh, there was a time when we were open to sharing, right? And, and, and in our sharing, many people took things, right? So, so with weaving, my family, we come from a legacy where our classes, our teaching is open to everybody. And um, like I said, my, um, my grandmother, Nani Selena, she was the first, one of the first to teach at the university level. And um, when she first started these classes and everybody came, uh, natives and non-natives, she got a, a, some flack from people. But she, my, my grandmother said, they, need, they, want, they want to learn, I'll teach them. And then they will appreciate the, all the work that goes into the weaving. And so, um, that started a legacy within our family that we want to share this art, but it's really important that people that are not of our culture who really enjoy this weaving 
They don't have they don't have the full circle of knowledge. They don't have the stories. They don't have the ancestors, you know. And so it's important that if they want to enjoy our weaving, that is good. But don't enter into the market for for um, for our uh, weaving, you know. Like um, we're we all as artists we live hand to mouth, you know. And so it's important that um, if you enjoy our art. That, that is fine, but don't knock us out of our market. We still need to, um, you know, have, uh, pay our bills. And so enjoy. It's also, um, you know, it does seem like it falls upon everyone to honor your own ancestors. And it seems like every culture in the world has their own textile traditions. So it seems yeah. like you also honor your own ancestors by studying your own culture's textile traditions. Um, someone was wondering how long your robe will be on display at the Boston MFA? I think it's going to be on display for a while. It took a while to get it up. <laughs> <laughs> I delivered it, I delivered it last, uh, not this last February, but the February before. Was it? Anyway, um, and then it took a while, it's, it, it, you know, because then all this, craziness happened in this world. So they just hung it up and um, and uh, it was going to be hung with the Swift robe because they commissioned me to be inspired by the Swift robe and to come up with my own pattern, but to be inspired by the Swift robe. And so they were gonna hang it up to the Swift robe. And then um, the, um, the pandemic happened and then all these museums are cutting down on their staff. And so the Peabody Museum who had initially agreed to share the robe and to have it hanging at the um, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, um, th then they've they've come they've taken their agreement back, and so um, I think it's all because of staffing. So anyway, it is on display, and I think it'll be on display for at least a year. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then, can I ask you what you're working on now, or what your future plans might be? If there's any projects that you're looking forward to. Yeah, I'm working on a um, Nahin robe. I'm back to doing a Nahin robe. And for the first time, I'm gonna do a diving whale robe. And I'm really excited about that because um, I did um, I did the, um, th that almost that last um, uh, slide uh, shows the, uh, my last Nahin robe was the uh, sea bean, the ruler of uh, weather and uh, waves. And now I'm going to do the diving whale, which, um, which is again, another form of the sea bean. And just like your robe in your collection in the uh, Ralph T. Uh, Co. collection, that is another uh, form of the sea bean of, that was so important to us canoe people. And it reminds us of the importance of the health of our oceans. I mean, we're nowadays really concerned about the health of our earth. And these old patterns remind us that um, how much we honored our ocean and to continue to honor our ocean. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you to be able to read um, people's thank yous. And if there's any last questions, otherwise um, we can call it a day. Thank you so much for taking this time. And thank you all of, all of you in the audience for taking the time. And if you missed part of the presentation, um, Rachel has recorded it and it will go up on the Co website. And then we're, we're doing one talk a month. So next month will be Jordan Crocker, who's, uh, she's Tongvin and um, in Kiowa. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn, very much. Thank you so much, Evelyn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me.